Um, I'd like to begin our lecture by taking uh, at least a few moments to express our deep appreciation uh, to Dr. Peter Boxer, who's present today, and his family for uh, the untiring support uh, of this outstanding lecture series. Um, we're very fortunate that Dr. Boxer is able to uh, be here again this year, and his continued presence is important to us and to the legacy of the Boxer family. Um, I, I have to uh, confession to make, since becoming dean, I, I actually had to read up on the Boxer lecture uh, and am absolutely impressed uh, by the legacy associated with it. Uh, this year's event marks the 42nd in a series that has attracted lecturers from across the nation, including 11 Nobel uh, laureates. The Boxer Lecture has a rich history here at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. The series began in 1969. It was, was then Rutgers Medical School and now Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School to honor Dr. George Boxer, a prominent cancer researcher. Dr. Boxer was an extraordinary individual and scientist, and the lectureship very much reflects that. He was a former executive director of the Merck Institute and associate editor of Cancer Research. The annual lecture has advanced Dr. Boxer's work and his memory for a generation of basic scientists who have followed in his esteemed footstep. Mrs. Uh, Lily Boxer will always be remembered for her commitment to the advancement of biomedical research and for being a catalyst who made the Boxer lecture, lecture a distinguished tradition in our medical school. Uh, and uh, I could go on and on. Before we begin today's program, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge a few other people. And first and foremost, a special thanks to Nobel laureate, Dr. Eric Wishhouse, for taking time out of his schedule to be here with us today. Dr. Wishhouse is well known for his research in Drosophila embryogenesis, and we're extremely pleased, as I am, that he's today's guest speaker. Uh, second, a very warm thank you to my new friend, uh, Gary Brewer, who has helped me helm a lot of important decisions in the last several uh, weeks and months, uh, Chair of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology for hosting today's lecture, and Dr. Mike Hampsey as well. Uh, and I now would like to turn the program over to Dr. Brewer uh, to continue today's lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gracias. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here today to the uh, George and Lily Boxer Memorial Lecture. And I would like to also thank the Boxer family, Dr. Peter Boxer, who's here today, who came from, I believe it was eight degree weather yesterday. Welcome to Balmy, uh, New Jersey. I'd also like to thank the Office of Communications and Public Affairs for doing a lot of the logistics that were uh, required to make this happen today. I'd also like to thank Dr. Mike Hampsey, who, uh, invited our speaker today. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to thank our speaker, Dr. Wishhouse, for accepting our invitation. So Dr. Wishhouse is the Squibb Professor of, in Molecular Biology. He's Professor of Molecular Biology and uh, at the Lewis Sigler Institute for Integrative Genomics, and he's also a member of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, I found out today that, well, uh, so I did a little bit of research on him. He, he graduated from Notre Dame in 1969, but I, I found out that he grew up in Alabama, as did I. I told him, though, that uh, my southern accent is quite a bit, uh, probably heavier than his. I said, well, you don't have any accent at all. It's interesting that we grew up about an hour and a half apart from each other. Uh, he got his PhD at Yale in 1974 and then did postdoctoral work at the University of Zurich after which he moved to the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg in 1978. Now, it's there that he met uh, Christiane Nusselin Villard. They started together at this institute, they shared the same lab, and they did the work over a course of about three years that led to a nature paper in 1980 in which they reported identifying genes in, in Drosophila embryogenesis and segmentation. Well, they continued work in that area over a number of years, and then they shared the 1995 Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine with the late Dr. Edward Lewis. For their discoveries, as the Nobel Committee said, their discoveries concerning the genetic control of early embryonic development. And, uh, <laughs> he was talking about the, the time that they spent together at EMBL. 
he and uh, Christiane of Newsland Villard, and in a bit of understatement said, yes, I guess it worked out well for us. So uh, with that, I, I think, uh, yes, it worked out, there you are, worked out quite well. And today he's going to talk about cellular mechanisms and shell shape change during Drosophila gastrulation. Thank you for accepting our invitation. I'm looking forward to your seminar. Dr. Wishhouse. I was going to say, as a developmental biologist, uh, the past 30, 35 years have been a really exciting time for our field and that we've come to, for many of the model organisms that we work with in the lab, we've come to understand quite a bit about the mechanisms that direct cells in an embryo into particular fates, how cells uh, and how cells become programmed to form specific, specific cell types, and a lot of the genes that are involved in specific, uh, in, in specific steps in that process. In Drosophila, which is the organism that I'm showing you here, we know, for example, that the early pattern in the embryo is actually established as gradients of maternally supplied gene products in the mother, for example, the gene products bicoid and dorsal, and that the way cells make choices in the embryo for, to, for particular fates is that individual cells in defined regions in the embryo respond to the concentrations of these gradients, activate specific transcription factors that direct the cells then into specific developmental pathways. Uh, in the particular case that I'll talk about today, the uh, cells on the ventral side of the embryo are, activate the expression of two genes, twist and snail, that direct these cells into mesodermal cell fates. Now, we know a lot about this, and there's still a lot of really, really fascinating, important questions that remain to be answered about how this system actually works. But what I'd like to do in today's talk is actually focus on the next event and a really surprising feature of embryonic development, which is that once cells have been assigned to particular fates, once they know what they're supposed to do, almost immediately those cell fate decisions that are present, the level of transcription factors and transcriptional outputs are transformed into cell behaviors. These mesodermal cells will move into the interior of the embryo where you want to have mesodermal derivatives like muscle. So you activate a cell fate on a transcriptional level, but you somehow translate that cell fate decision into properties of the cell, movement, actually physical properties that change where the cell is, how the cell behaves. And it's that idea of the actual the, the transition between a genetic programming and a mechanical properties of cells that I'd like to talk about today. Now, uh, that means we're really going to end up talking about, in a, in a very simple-minded, uh, simplified way, a sense of, of not gene activity, but cell mechanics. And you can ask, why would you want to do this? Uh, when, uh, why is this, I believe, a necessary step in our understanding of development? Well, on the one hand, what cells do and how they move, that is the actual process. It's driven by genes and different uh, concentrations of gene activity, but to know what's really going on, you really you need to, in a certain sense, step back from the gene products and actually understand the, the physics of the mechanics of the property of the process. There's another reason for me personally in that in my career, I've spent most of my time understanding development, if you will, in terms of gene activity. And I have a certain picture, a certain cartoon in my head. So one of the attractions, and I'm saying this specifically directed to the younger people in the audience, that an attractive strategy in science, when you think you understand something, is to change the field a little bit, or at least change your point of view, and ask whether, in this case, whether the things that the cartoon that we have from gene expression patterns or protein distributions is enough to explain the visible phenomena 
that you see. So it's almost like a test of our genetic understanding. That'll be an underlying theme. It'll be a question that's not fully answered, but it is part of the goal for pushing forward in this direction. Now, so trying to understand things mechanically is a good idea. Why study cell mechanics during Drosophila gastrulation? Well, beyond just the molecular biology and the, 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 the genetics and all the tools that are available in Drosophila, there are, I think, two for me, really strong reasons behind my choice to study these self-shaped changes and these morphological movements in fly embryos. And one of them is that if you look in an embryo uh, that the, uh, in these early stages, that the cell-shaped changes during Drosophila gastrulation are rapid and very, and conceptually very simple. So these two EMs, for example, are uh, the embryos were fixed about 10 to 15 minutes apart. The upper embryo, which is at a cellular blastoderm stage, all the cells on the ventral side look very similar. And 15 minutes later, though, you can see this fold has formed that's bringing the mesoderm cells into the interior. And you can see that in this live movie here. Each of the, if you take this embryo and break it in half, such that you can scan the cells, you can see that the individual cells are long columnar cells. They're about five microns across, about 30 microns deep. Each of these panels is about four minutes apart. So you get a rapid changes in cell shape leading to this morphological change. No cell division. I'll show you later. No change in volume. No changes in, uh, in cell neighborhoods. Cells aren't moving relative to each other. The simple view is that you have to understand this process just in terms of what the individual cell shape changes, can we piece them together? Can we build a machine that would do this? So that's one advantage. Uh, there's a second advantage in that because of a peculiarity of Drosophila development, we, one of the complications always in looking in biology is, uh, is, is that any cell type that you, look, you work with has a history. And a lot of the things that happen can reflect that history. And in a certain sense, these early cells that we're looking at are very special, because in a certain sense, they don't have a history. The way fly embryos begin their development is after fertilization, a series of rapid nuclear divisions in this egg. Uh, the, the, these nuclear mitoses occur without cell division. So you have a fertilized egg that has increasing number of nuclei. Those nuclei migrate to the surface, and after 13 rounds, they pause in these mitoses. And this is a strategy. These nuclear replica replications are very rapid. It's a way of, within about an hour and a, an hour and a half, of producing a multicellular organism, where you, you replicate your nuclei, and then only after the 13th division do you subdivide the embryo into cells. And that happens by membrane being pulled down between adjacent nuclei here until you have a single sheet of cells. Membrane's pulled down between nuclei, and then you separate the single layer of cells from the underlying yolk. It's at this moment, within about a, a minute of the completion of this cellularization, when you have this polarized epithelium just newly formed, that these cell shape changes occur. So the cells don't have any history. So what you'd like to know is mechanically what you have to do to these cells to produce the visible fold that you see. You can look morphologically. And what we've known for 10, 15 years is that there is essentially uh, the major morphological feature is that these columnar cells undergo a process whereby they constrict their apices. Initially, that constriction over a period of about 8 to 10 minutes uh, results in a cell elongation. The constrictions continue. The cells begin to shorten. And uh, it's that shortening that drives the actual invagination. So there's an elongation phase that's captured here, and then a shortening phase where the actual buckling of the cells move into the interior. If you look 
and you say that, that uh, you need, for these morphological changes, you need some force generating machine in the cell to do it. Uh, one of the early clues was that following the, uh, the, the accumulation of, of the cytoplasmic my, uh, myosin II in the cells. And at the end of cellularization, the myosin is all localized on the base, on the basal side of the cells. That's the inside of the cells. That's probably that's due to the, this process of moving membrane into the interior during cellularization. But in these ventral cells that are going to be mesoderm, what you see almost immediately is a redistribution or a change in the distribution of the myosin, such that there's now a population of myosin on the apical surface of these cells, apparent loss basally. And what we're doing is putting a contractile machine on the apical surface, and it's easy to see, or easy to imagine or cartoon in your mind how that, uh, such a contractile machine would actually drive the cell shape change that we see here. So this is, this is basically a cell biological uh, understanding of a bit of how the process would work. We can be a little bit more precise about that and actually learn a little bit more about the process um, by actually looking in greater detail at the distribution of myosin in these cells. Our initial tendency in thinking about the process, and it was the way I talked about it before, is that individual cells undergo cell shape changes. They become, uh, go from columnar to this trapezoidal shape. And the, the, uh, the driving force is this myosin accumulation. If you actually look down at the surface of cells, and you can see here the myosin in green on the surface of these 800 mesodermal cells. And what you can see is there's a peculiar feature of this myosin is that it's organized, but not in any kind of organization that actually reflects individual cells. It's not like a ring of myosin in each cell that constricts these cells. Instead, there's a network of actin and myosin that forms apically in the surface of all of these 800 mesodermal cells. And this network, uh, if you, if you superimpose the outlines of individual cells, you can see that there's no real relationship between myosin in a given cell and a, a, a contractile circuit. It's more of a network that can, appears to expand one cell to the next. Myosin, this is obviously um, not myosin molecules themselves, but the organization of actin myosin filaments in a cell confronting a junction. The critical thing here is that most of this, these most of the confrontations occur perpendicular to the surface of the cells. Now, um, there's one other feature of this myosin that's, uh, that, that you can follow. Actually, it's probably easier to see in the next figure, the next panel. So we zero in on an individual cell, and we watch the myosin accumulation in that cell. What you can see is that myosin is accumulating and going down. And so this network is actually a pulsating network with local areas of pulsation that correspond to individual cells. And the cell, <coughs> as a myosin accumulates in the cell, you can see the outline of the cell becoming apical surface becoming smaller and smaller. If you track individual cells, what you can see is at least at the level that we've been able to resolve, the pulsing pattern in individual cells is independent of the pulsing pattern in adjacent cells. It's just that this network is locally undergoing chemical, uh, local, in a local cellular chemical environment, a contraction that is driving the cell shape change. If you now look at individual cells on the surface and you follow over uh, uh, the periodicity of these contractions, about 90, 90 seconds, of myosin will accumulate and then go down, uh, deteriorate and then accumulate again. Uh, and follow the outline, what you can see, and this is consistent with this overall geometry of the a myosin network is the accumulation of myosin in the cell doesn't result in a constricting ring, but a distortion of the surface, as though surface is being pulled in from different angles in this network. 
And then as myosin, the pulse ends and myosin goes away, the cell again assumes a polygonal shape, but the apical surface is smaller. And so through six or seven such pulses over a period of, of eight minutes, the cell apices constricts down to almost zero. Now, what I've given you so far is, uh, a, a, in a sense, it's a very satisfying description of the, what could be driving this cell shape change, myosin accumulation in the surface of the embryo. Now, what I have to emphasize is that we've been focusing our microscope on this little area, only on the apical surface. And that's where we see the myosin. If you like to remind you, though, that the cell is much bigger than that. And what you'd like to ask is, can you, is this myosin accumulation that we see here part of the picture? Is it the whole picture? Can we account for the behavior, for the shape change of the cell, this elongated cell, just simply by putting myosin here at the surface? And so to do, to begin to address that more global question of is, can we really understand a cell shape change just by doing one, putting one little thing in one part of the cell, what we've had to do is do two things, improve our imaging, to use two photon image, imaging at a more rapid time scale to be able to collect data through the whole cell stack, not just the surface, and then also develop software strategies that allow us to reconstruct the cells over time and measure different properties of the cells, cell volume and other and different events that are happening in the cell relative to the myosin accumulation that happens in that particular cell at that time. So <coughs> when you do that, a couple of observations that uh, were important is that, uh, to make initially is that during this rapid process, cell volumes are constant. The cell's constricting here. There's a certain sequence. The cell elongates. The nucleus moves with this elongation. There's an extension of microtubules inside the cell, a whole bunch of processes that we can see happening that could be uh, the active processes contributing to the, the cell shape change itself, or they could just be passive responses of this simple view of a myosin, of a myosin contractility. So one of the ways that we've tried to address that <coughs> has been to follow each morphological change, the lengthening of the cell or the repositioning of the nucleus or the increase in surface area, anything that we can measure, and ask, how does that occur during the, the course of uh, development? This is some data from Matthias Kashuba, uh, who's following the length of the cell. I mean, you can see that over the period of time during gastrulation, this, the cells are getting longer and longer, about 40% uh, um, 70% increase in length. When Matthias showed me this line, this is a single cell trace. And I said, yeah, it's going up. And this is my response as a biologist. It, and, um, and Matthias was saying, no, look, see all these little bumps here. And I was saying, Matthias, that's the way all of my straight lines look. It's, this is not. Um, but you can actually test the significance of these lines. Of, of these, what Matthias was interpreting as steps by taking this data, taking it for hundreds of cells, filtering the data, taking the derivative, and ask when are these pulses, when are these steps occurring in elongation, and how do they correlate? And how, if, if there is uh, incremental stepwise elongations, uh, how does that correspond to uh, apical myosin uh, driven apical constriction? So, what you do under those circumstances, obviously, you just do it. A correlation analysis where you can uh, track apical constriction in individual cells and lengthening and ask, is there, uh, are these pulses in behavior coordinated? And so I'm showing you here the data for elongation. During cellularization, the cells are getting longer and there are pulses in actin myosin localization at the top, but there's zero correlation until the onset of gastrulation. And then the correlation jumps up 
to about 0.5, 0.6. That's not a great correlation, but it's fairly, it's very statistically very significant. It means that when a cell pulses, the cell, you, the cell elongates. Cell pulses, elongates, pulses, elongates. And the best, um, you can also ask, is there a lag time between myosin accumulation and cell elongation? And the, the lag time is zero, effectively, the, the tightest correlation. You can calculate your way through and say it might be four seconds. There's some minimalist lag time. But essentially, what these results are telling us is that at least for cell elongation, even though there are microtubules that are elongating everything else, the temporal correlation that matters is accumulation of myosin and apical constriction. And that drives elongation. We have the same results for nuclear positioning for every morphological aspect that we've been able to measure over this uh, 10 to 15 minute interval, the, you have a, the time correlation goes myosin contraction in this cell, and this thing happens. So that's a correlation. It's not a causality argument. But it's a strong correlation. So our simple view that arises from this is that, uh, oh, I can't. All morphological, go out on a limb and say, all morphological changes that occur in individual cells during ventral furrow formation are pulsed and temporally correlate with apical constriction and myosin accumulation. And what this suggests is that maybe we can think of cells and they have constant volume. The cells are essentially like water filled balloons, and you squeeze them at one place, then they're going to extend. And that is the driving mechanism that we were uh, working with here. Now, um, what you could ask, though, is we have enough data. We really know how cells change their shape. Can we model water-filled balloons strung together with an apical constrictive force? What do we need to do? What kinds of assumptions do we to actually produce the visible morphology that we see? So this is work of Oleg Polyakov, who's a uh, just recently graduated uh, graduate student in the, in the physics department in a collaboration with Josh Shavitz and Matthias Kashuba, and uh, some said me. Um, and what, um, and I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but I'm just basically the major features of Oleg's model is it's a two-dimensional model. A three-dimensional one works as well, but gets more complicated. We're only going to deal with the two-dimensional surface, and we're going to imagine that there's an active component, which is just myosin contraction apically, and a response, which is essentially the responses that you would predict, an elastic response, which is just due to uh, treating different areas and different surfaces of the cells as springs. So there would be a, distort, a cost to stretching the lateral surfaces, a cost to stretching the basal surfaces. <coughs> uh, those can be different for lateral surface, basal, apical, uh, cost to, uh, great cost to ch any change in volume. And you can <coughs> The argument is going to be that the actual final morphology of the cells, and whether you produce an invagination or not, is going to depend on the relative costs of different distortions. So then what you can do is you can ask your computer to go through all different possible parameters, all different, the ratio, essentially the morphology is going to be the ratio of one K to another K. You can ask, what are the distributions that will actually produce visible morphologies. Um, and a really simple-minded, uh, one of the things that became clear was very that the really central feature, since we're constricting the apices, is the relative spring strengths of the lateral surface versus the basal surface. So if your, uh, if your, Lateral springs are very weak, then you'll maintain the volume and you'll, in, you'll allow apicles to constrict by making longer and longer cells. If the basal 
springs are very weak, what will happen is that the basal surface will expand and the length of the cells will stay pretty much the same. That's not very, <laughs> didn't have to have a, well, we had to, but we didn't have to have a computer to tell you that, but that's essentially the way that what, what happens here. Now, if you go back and you then ask, what are the kinds of morphologies you get? We're focusing only on that. Is that if you have, um, uh, if you want to make a furrow, what you have to have is the lateral surfaces have to be much stiffer than the basal surfaces. If you have weak lateral surfaces, what you end up with is these elongated cells. So that's kind of reassuring. But um, if you go back and look at the morphology, what you actually see is that there's no set of parameters that we can choose that will actually mimic the process of invagination. The closest we can come reflects this idea that there's really two phases in the process, an elongation phase and an invagination phase. And what we would like to suggest is that then the first eight minutes, which is this is when myosin is visibly contracting, that results in this elongation phase. And then there's a transition to the actual invagination. And this transition in our current model, we imagine is being driven by a change in the spring constants, basally, or a change in one of the, the, the spring constants. And so, and I'd like to remind you that at the beginning of gastrulation, we have myosin basally. We begin to accumulate it apically, and we actually have a gradual loss of myosin basally in these cells. So one possible model is that this loss in the elasticity, the, the stiffness or of the basal side of the cell that's required for this transition to drive the invagination. It's just this gradual loss in myosin or gradual loss in elasticity until the cells pass this magical calculation point where the uh, spring const the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the base of the cells will expand and the uh, length of the, uh, of the cells will uh, now uh, will, sh will shorten back. Now, uh, we look at the data here. Uh, this is going to drive us to what is probably the most controversial and, and unreliable thing I'm going to tell you today, is that if you think when myosin is doing its work, myosin is doing its work essentially to achieve apical constriction during this early phase that's driving elongation. And in a certain sense, the work of that myosin is translated into an elongation of the cell in the same way that work on a spring will translate into, will store that energy or that work in a stretched spring, in the stretched surfaces of these elongated cells. That's the most economic, that's the most um, the simplest redistribution of, of that energy. What happens is that then as myosin becomes weaker, what we would propose is that the stored energy of myosin constriction that has been stored in these postulated lateral springs is now converted, is now used to actually drive the shortening or the expansion of the cells and drives the actual invagination. And one of the reasons we're thinking about that is that if you look at the length of the cells, cells elongate here, and then they, this very spring-like quality where the length of the cells after the process is the same as it was at the beginning. So, so you're stretching a spring and coming back. Uh, and so that would explain in the temporal sequence. So I like that model. I've tried to talk to my cell biologist friends about this. And they think it's the most ridiculous thing. Some of them think it's, uh, well, the, the issue is where do these magical springs live in the cell? 
And what is uh, and the natural response? Well, this is the myosin actin cytoskeleton, but we know that part of the that uh, actin myosin cytoskeleton under tension will re will constantly restructure. And so what we're demanding of a spring restructures. If any of you remember slinkies and pulling slinkies out of that the, the reason springs don't work anymore is that all the molecules restructure inside the spring. And so what you would require for this model is biological springs that are sufficiently elastic, that they can store potential energy over a period of eight minutes, or six minutes of what. So that brings us then to, I keep forgetting I can do this from here, the actual physical properties of cells. And can we begin to approach or try to understand what are the elastic properties of cells during imagination? So <clears throat> the way that we've approached this is building, um, injecting fluorescent beads into the, whoop, oh, oh. no. Oh. Fluorescent beads into the embryo and then uh, we'll see a variety of approaches, but we use paramagnetic beads and we're going to exert, we build little mag, oh, like, and it's built little magnets and tried to ask, what are the elastic, tried to begin to measure the elastic responses of the embryo. So we're now looking at an embryo, you can, this is labeled with histone GFP and the embryo, we've turned on the magnet and we turned off the magnet. Turn on the magnet and turn it. So what you can see is an elastic response. So there is an elasticity. We can measure that. Two features are that it obviously didn't spring back to the, where it was in the beginning. But there is a relaxation time that's in the order of a, a minute and a half or two minutes during this time. So we have springs, and they, have, uh, they can store energy, if you will, for a minute and a half or two minutes. That's not quite long enough for what we need, but uh, so what we really, I, I think that there are problems, that are, we need to think this through a little bit. Uh, this result positions us midway between believing the model and disproving the model, if you will. So it's an okay place to be. We can survive there for a while longer. But um, <clears throat> another feature, though, that's actually interesting, even if you don't use the magnets, you can... Um, just inject fluorescent beads and follow them. And they kind of bobble around for a while. And then when the invagination occurs, the beads follow the cells into the embryo. And so you can, uh, we're, using the, we're using these strategies in part to try to measure the viscosity, the viscous properties of the cytoplasm. I can tell you that cytoplasm behaves as though it's extremely viscous, 95% uh, glycerin. Uh, what we've been trying to do is to do similar experiments where you follow the movement because of the viscosity of the cytoplasm, you put a bead in and it stays in a given place in the cytoplasm. That it actually acts as a marker for cytoplasmic flows. So initially what we were going to do, trying to do is to follow a cell shape change by following the cytoplasmic flows within that cell and ask how the surface of the cell changes versus the, how cytoplasm within the cell flows. And that's still an ongoing project, but Konstantin Dubravinsky, uh, realized um, that if you actually just follow globally all the beads in an embryo that you inject, you can establish tracks and, be and the behaviors of individual beads. And from that data and multiple embryos and collapsing along the anterior posterior axis, we can establish <clears throat> velocity fields for the beads in the embryos. So what we're actually showing here are is looking head on, and this is the, the directions and the velocities of, of beads and therefore, mul multiple beads and therefore the, the cytoplasm in the, during the process of this ventral furrow formation. From these diagrams, we can uh, uh, develop streamlines for the flows of cytoplasm. When you look at this as if it, with these, these patterns of cytoplasm, which we're looking at over the whole embryo, look like, uh, uh, resemble laminar flows of a, a viscous fluid. And so we're 
put something in the cortex of the embryo, we contract, and that drives in this viscous fluid a, a certain movement or flow of the cytoplasm. We can ask whether that way of thinking about it is true simply by looking at the, looking at the data that we have and ask, does the velocity patterns that we observe follow the Navier-Stokes equation? Actually, just the Stokes equations, because everything is so viscous. And what you can do is you can take a given area of the embryo. Uh, and what, you, the, what the Stokes equations allow you to do is if you, you were told the velocity vector, given the velocity vectors around the perimeter of any area, you can predict if this is simply viscous flow, the uh, distribution, the, the, the vectors anywhere in the area that's defined here. And so when you do that, you can ask, do the visible measurements that you see follow theory? This is the match of the theory pattern to the measurement pattern or the, the overall the theory allows us to predict within about a 10 to 15 percent accuracy uh, uh, for uh, uh, vectors over the whole surface. So we're able to, that's very close to our, what we think is our measurement accuracy. So what we're saying is that this, the global pattern of cytoplasmic redistribution can be predicted just by the Navier-Stokes equations. Now this is a kind of a weird or unexpected observation. Whoop. Because to be able to apply these equations, you have to have two things. You basically have to imagine that the cytoplasm behaves uh, as a continuous uh, uh, fluid. It's not, um, uh, it's not divided into bigger units than what you're able to measure. It's a continuous, a continuous fluid. And that means it's not really behaving like it's being divided up into cells. And it also, these equations really only apply for viscous fluids. If you have any elasticity here, then you're going to have the, the devia you will have deviations from the, the Stokes equations. So certainly over, over time. If you think if you put, as a spring begins to uh, uh, be stretched, it resists and you get, you'll have deviations from Stokes. So this is, what this argues is then that cells don't matter in elasticity doesn't matter. So we could ask, well, do membranes retard the flow patterns? And what Bing Hay did was to develop strategies that allow us to attach the beads to plasma membrane or to have them free in the cytoplasm, film them, reconstruct, and ask, if a bead is stuck on the membrane, does it behave differently? Does it flow? Does it deviate from Stokes flow uh, versus beads on the um, and beads free in the cytoplasm. And what Bing found is that, there's, that beads on the surface attaching beads doesn't alter their flow patterns at all. They're identical between beads in the cytoplasm, beads on the surface, and both of them can be predicted by the Stokes equations, which again means that membrane is not offering resistance, is not accounting for the behaviors that we're seeing here. So all this time, we've been thinking about the whole process of morphogenesis. So we have an epithelium with individual cells. The individual cells undergo individual shape changes, and we put them together to build a furrow. This is making us wonder whether the subdivision of the embryo into discrete cells is really necessary at all. Now, there is a, going to bring, back, bring you back to one of the peculiar advantages of fly embryology. I told you at the beginning of the lecture that flies begin their development as a syncytial embryo, and they only form these cells after 13 rounds of divisions, making the cellular blastoderm immediately before blastoderm, uh, before onset of gastrulation. Now, this transition between the early syncytial nuclear divisions and the 
process of, of the pause in the cell cycle and the process of cellularization that produces a cellular blastoderm is an interesting stage in development because it marks the point in the embryo where the embryo uh, begins to rely on its own transcription for processes. Up to this point here, uh, the embryo, everything that we've seen, the mitotic divisions, is being driven by maternally supplied gene products that are able to cycle through these uh, and do everything, this program here, just simply from a maternal machine. If you inject alpha mannitin into embryos early, they will come up to this point. They won't be able to go any farther. To enter the process of cellularization or gastrulation, you require transcription. And it's, of course, at this stage where you're setting up the patterns uh, of gene expression that define mesoderm and make the cells mesoderm. But it's also at this stage where you're transcribing for the first time genes that are required for this process of cellularization or subdivision of the embryo. Uh, we've been able to show through a set of genetic experiments that this process of cellularization requires transcription, requires expression of, of genes. There's no single gene in the genome that's required for making membranes. But we found that there are two genes that play a uh, particularly important roles. One was SLAM that was cloned by Thomas Lacuy in the lab in 2002. And uh, a second one, discontinuous nuclear organism, uh, uh, cortex, which has uh, recently been, uh, Bing Hay has recently identified in the lab. Neither, when you remove either of these genes, they are somewhat abnormal during cellularization. Differently abnormal, but abnormal. But they all undergo a partial process of cellularization. The exciting thing for us is if we eliminate both of them. And so what happens in these doubly mutant embryos for slam dunk, <laughs> I tried that, <laughs> that's OK, um, <laughs> is that rather than partitioning this syncytial embryo into um, individual cells, as you can see here. When you eliminate uh, the, the slam dunk phenotype, is that you still actually make membrane, but it's disorganized. It's in this flocular kind of material here. The embryo remains a uh, syncytium, one big cell, 500 microns across. We've done this by removing two zygotic genes without altering any maternal components at all. Everything else is normal in these embryos, except that they don't have cells. In in, oops. Oh. OK. In particular, if we look at these embryos, uh, they express twist and snail. Uh, if in a region of the cytoplasm, on the, in the nuclei that are on the region, in the cytoplasm on the ventral side of this big cell, um, they, uh, and uh, this elicits uh, reorganization of actin and myosin in the surface. So that I, I may not be able, I won't show you. But the crucial thing is now what happens to these embryos when, uh, if you don't have any lateral or basal membranes at all? Do they gastrolyte? So this is actually a wild type embryo. This is light, just, um, and what you can see here, this is yolk, and this is the individual nuclei. You can maybe see the membrane moving down between adjacent nuclei here. And this is the ventral floor. This is the endodermal invaginations here. Um, this is about a, a 20 minute span. You can see the endoderm moving in here. It's, they're easier to film in this, this direction. I, we use a lot of things labeled with GFP. We spend a lot of time looking at GFP. But I actually love looking at wild type embryos, too. I think they're amazing. Um, you can see the cell membrane pushing down between the adjacent nuclei. And the embryo begins gastrulation. These are pole cells that are being brought into the interior of the embryo in the posterior midgut. Uh, it is an amazing process. So now, this is an embryo which is missing uh, slam and dunk. You're not going to be able to see a member. You can see the nuclei at the surface. It started a little bit later. Beginning to gastrulate. 
you can see these veggies, this is, it is, an amazing job, and then it dies. <laughs> um, so it's not good to not have membranes. Um, but it, these embryos are under, able to undergo remarkable, these similar reorganizations. Uh, if we plot out, if we inject them with beads and do the cytoplasmic flows, they're again identical. Whether we have the beads stuck on membranes or free in the cytoplasm or membranes that have no membranes, embryos that have no membranes at all. And so the way that we're thinking about this process is that this redistribution of cytoplasm is essentially as though you were, imagine you had the viscous fluid here, you, actually, you could do this with a you wouldn't have to do it with two pots. You could do interconnected pots, but you would slide these lids, and the drag will create a certain flow pattern that would be predicted on the surface of the embryo, uh, would be driven by a movement of the surface of the embryo that drives internal flows with no membranes at all. Now, what you would predict, uh, this is the interest, this is an interesting thing that, um, we have talked about cell shape changes. And one of the ways of thinking about cell shape changes is to take a block of cytoplasm that's defined by a cell and say, how does that cytoplasm move? Or how does it redistribute? We can do the same thing in an acellular embryo, computationally. We can take the flow patterns and say, how would, if we defined an artificial cell here, how does that cell change its shape? How does that virtual cell, that has no cell membranes given these flow patterns, undergo the, and this, the flow patterns that are created or generated in these acellular embryos are identical to the ones that are generated in embryos where blocks of cytoplasm are actually partitioned by individual membranes. So all of this argues that at least that this, that in, the, that, um, in these early, these phases of gastrulation, are not driven by the, uh, they're, they're driven just by viscous flow. That, that's the idea of, maybe the idea of cells as being water-filled balloons was wrong. Now, uh, Constantine was happy, Olick was not. <laughs> he had spent most of his thesis arguing, you know, trying to re do, <laughs> mimic these processes by treating, you know, elastic elements. Now, what you, but what, became clear to us was that you could say, well, what is it that these embryos can't do, these acellular embryos? Are there things that they do? Are there things that they can't do? If you watch them, and now we're just looking at nuclei here, the initial phase, and depending on the temperature, is this elongation phase. And then at, in this time lapse, about uh, 11, somewhere between 11, there's a movement of uh, elongation and then a shortening that drives the inter internalization of the mesoderm. What the slam dunk embryos do well is this initial elongation phase. What they don't do, can't do, is the shortening or the invagination. So what we would propose is that a slam dunk double embryos without lateral membranes behave like modeled epithelial grids in which K length, that is the spring constants, the lateral spring are, are very, very weak. So you just get elongation. If you remember, that was also our postulated first phase of gastrulation. They, here they're probably non-existent, the K length, but you get no resistance, and so you don't store any of the energy. So you can't shorten. You, you require the lateral springs, actually, in Oleg's model, to shorten. The elongation of the lateral springs is a passive response of viscosity, but it's crucial that you have them 
to be able to move into the shortening phase. And so that gets us back to uh, trying to balance these two models. And we think what we need to do, obviously, is to refine our measurements of elasticity. One of the crucial elements uh, it will be to, uh, to try to get some sense of what the forces are that are driving the flows apically. Uh, is, there, uh, um, the, is there elasticity, lateral, uh, lateral elasticity, which is very weak relative to the apical forces and relative to the flow, but still sufficient to store energy to drive the invaginous. We haven't been able to model or work through. Uh, we're still in the process of trying to think our way through that. But the interesting idea that's come to us uh, is this critique, if you will, of the way that we've thought about morphology. And up to this point, we've been thinking about morphology as the properties of individual cells. And, trying to, and we believe that we could understand global changes in morphology by adding up the behaviors of individual cells. And what these results suggest to us is that maybe a more powerful intellectual approach is to develop ones that are really based more globally on the behavior, on the, the total embryo and on flow patterns or redistributions of cytoplasm. In, in some places, the subdivision may be important, but in other places, it's not essential and maybe interferes with your understanding of the process. So what I uh, wanted to uh, point out, uh, so in terms of the general summary, I think that one of the powerful things that I've learned is that how, how much you know, beyond genetics and beyond the kind of manipulations that are possible in genetics, what remains really true is a, a powerful, how powerful just looking at things is, how looking and measuring, looking accurately, and trying to extract data from the actual wild behaviors of wild type embryos. Most of what we've done here, with the exception of the acellular embryos, has not been conventional genetic manipulations, but just trying to measure what cells really do. Um, Uh, another thing that's kind of intriguing is that simple biophysical principles can explain much. And that's attractive, because uh, most of us have some vague memory of our physics. And it, it does have the wonderful property of being able to step up above, a little bit above the process, without having to deal so much with individual molecules to really understand things at a, a, a more abstract but still rigorous way. Uh, it's also interesting that, um, uh, again, that's true for non-compressible fluids, for viscous properties, and that how we think about cell membranes and the roles that they play, there were membranes there. And I believe those membranes will have a certain measurable elasticity. But the measurable elasticity of those lateral membranes is not relevant or not a drive, not even large enough to, to drive or influence the processes. So we need to, it's wonderful that you have rare genetic, you know, genetic manipulations are very powerful because they suddenly make you see things or think about things that you wouldn't have otherwise. So I'm going to stop there. The work on, the, our most recent work on ventral flow formation was initiated by Adam Martin when he was a postdoc in the lab working with Matthias Kaschuber, who was a, a theory fellow in the, uh, the Lewis Sigler Institute, the help of two undergraduates, Michael Gelbart and Zia Khan, who were particularly, who developed the software, uh, the, the, the strategies that have allowed us to do most of the computational work. More recently, our work on um, the work that I, Two-thirds of the work was worked by Bing He, uh, some by Mo Wang, whose work I wasn't really able to talk about today, Oleg Polyakov, and Konstantin Dubovinsky. Thank you for your attendance, and uh, take any questions. <laughs>